You're watching the One Fish Comms webinar series, Friction Free. I'm your host, Carrie Benningfield, and in this series, we talk about finding and removing the friction that slows good people down from doing their best work. With me today is Anthony Quinn. Uh, Anthony is a systems thinker, an organizational problem solver, an expert in emerging technology for innovation, and the closest I know to a polymath. He's a regular feature on the improv scene here in Cambridge, and in another life, designed an app uh, called DNA Disco, in front of which you dance, um, and after analysing your style, will tell you which endangered species you dance most like. I'm a giant panda, as it happens. Um, Anthony is part of our extended team here at One Fish, Two Fish, and has worked with us on organisational innovation projects and via his innovation company, Intermingled. So delighted to have you with us, Anthony. Thank you, Carrie. Delighted to be here. So Anthony, you say that leadership is about creating the conditions for effectively intermingling people and ideas. Can you tell us a bit more about that? Sure. So um, in my view, at least anyway, that most innovation happens by mixing and remixing things that already exist. So they could be ideas that exist in the world or people's perspectives and their, and their needs and their problems and their unique perspective on the world. And whenever that's happened in history, so for example, in Moorish Spain, there's been an incredible explosion of innovation and new ideas. So I think that the way for organisations in our modern era to stay competitive and to stay ahead and, and fresh is to take that same approach. And tell us, what does that look like in practice in organisations? Sure. And, and, and perhaps let's start, let's start from a really, really, really practical point of view, and then we'll come on to the leadership side of that later. Sure, so a good example of how this has already been done and has been done for many years are Agile software teams. So the Agile manifesto, for people who don't know, is about putting people above processes. So it's about human interaction, about people talking to each other on a regular basis and reviewing what they do and bringing in diverse strands of experience and perspectives. So in a typical Agile software team, you might have people who are software engineers, people who are user experience designers, You'll have people who are kind of know, know about testing, but mixing into that group, you also have people with domain expertise who really understand the needs of the user. And it's through that effective facilitation of those skills and abilities and perspectives that you, that's when the good stuff happens. And that's interest, really interesting that you talk about facilitation. So, so I guess traditionally what we would have done is done those things separately and in, and in a sequence. So um, there'd be some domain experts who might do, um, help out with designing something and then it would all get specified and designed and then it would be handed over to another team who would build it and finally to a team of people who would sell it. And that'd be true whether it was software and so on. And actually you're talking about mixing all those people up. And I guess there's a reason we haven't done that in the past because it's complicated and messy and um, duplication and redundancy and so on. Sure. So, so t tell us what that, you use the word facilitation, what does that mean and how can we do it in such a way that it doesn't kind of scram scramble all our eggs? <laughs> sure, good analogy with the eggs. Yeah, facilitation in my mind is, has both a literal sense. So it's the idea of doing what facilitators do. So facilitating meetings, events, workshops, conferences. So that's the kind of thing that we think of when we think of facilitator. But in my mind, it also has a broader metaphorical sense as well of facilitating interactions and facilitating encounters. So for example, I, I used to be a software engineer and um, because of my age, you know, I worked in a time before Agile. Agile existed in the early 90s when I started, but it was very, very, um, it was only used by a very small number of people. So the ideas have been around for a long time. And so for example, it, the kind of the ideas, that way of working that originated in Japan in the Toyota production system, but hadn't yet reached a kind of critical mass in software where many people knew what it was. So I saw what happened when you worked in the old fashioned way of people working on their little bit in a production line process in software where everything that you need has already been specified and everything that you do will feed into the next stage. And when it works well, it's great. And it's a great way to build bridges, literally build bridges, as in bridges over motorways. But it's not a great way to build software because software is complex, it's emergent, people will respond to it in different ways. And often we're building things that have never been built before. So it's very hard to know what's gonna work and what isn't. So if we can build in 
those short iteration cycles where we can make something, quickly test it, and so on. And more importantly, work with people who have that different perspective. People spot problems and opportunities before they get out into the real world and cause us problems. So much the better. So when Agile came along and I first encountered it, I thought, this is it. You know, having experienced the pain of the old fashioned way of working and working for a software product company where literally our life as a company depended on the quality of our products. Then seeing Agile come through and thinking, yeah, this, this isn't a panacea. It's not going to solve all our problems, but it's certainly going to be better than what went before. But of course, well, like, as you suggested, mixing those eggs together, um, sometimes it causes problems. So for people who weren't used to that way of working or had chosen software because it allowed them to sit in a, in a room all day in a cubicle and just tap away on a keyboard without interacting with human beings at all, for those people, it was very difficult. Mm. So it doesn't mean that those people had to leave, but it meant that the processes had to be adapted to the needs of the team. So that's, that's the facilitation. And, and tell us a bit more about that. And because you're, you're somebody who, who likes interaction, you're hugely responsive, you know, definition of a, uh, an improv, improv person, I guess, is somebody who can um, use everything that is thrown at them in, in the moment. So I can see how agile for you would be a really natural um, way of working that you would far prefer to use and would happily move across from kind of cubicle, silent in your cubicle approach. But for many people in organisations who are trying to create these con conditions for intermingling people and ideas, um, they have a, a work workforce of people who either don't prefer to work that way or never really have before, and whose identity and um, status and entrenched ways of working will be, will be fundamentally challenged. So how would you approach that? Sure, that, that's, that's a really good question, and that's a question that comes up. Uh, many times, not just in software teams, but whenever you mix together people from different backgrounds with different personalities and different expectations of, of work and what look, work should look like. Um, and in those situations, certainly like the agile software community has learned many things over the last 25, 30 years of doing this in practice. But also we can draw on what other industries or areas of life have done. So for example, in, a, in an improv team, so an improvised theatre team, Effectively, it's similar to a product team in the sense that every night you get on stage, you have customers, you call the audience, you create a product, which you call the story, and you're using resources that you have to hand. All you've got is what's on the stage, and all you've got is the time allotted to you, 60 minutes, 45 minutes, whatever. And within that time, you've got to produce a product which is satisfying to the customers so that A, they feel like it was worth paying the money, and B, they want to come back and see you again next week. And so Im improv teams have learned techniques for collaboration. So for example, they, they'll learn how to overcome their own inner critic. So they've learned how to not suppress their own ideas and to realize that something that may seem incredibly obvious and perhaps even stupid to them isn't obvious and isn't stupid to someone else because they've got their own unique perspective. And they've also learned to do that for others as well. And so if I think that my ideas are good enough to share with the world, and I think that your ideas are good enough to share with the world, and I, and I want to build on your ideas because I want to make you look good, then when you couple that together in a team, that's when the magic happens. And, that's and how, do you, how would you take people in teams who are not used to working in that way and for whom that approach is uh, daunting and threatening sure. and allow them to explore and build and practice new ways of collaborating together that make them more successful than they were before? Sure. So, so improv, um, improv teachers and the community again have, like the agile community, have learned what works and what doesn't, and they've learned how to bring the best out of people. So improv can sometimes look like a bunch of extroverts together, just riffing off each other's ideas. But actually, some of the best improvisers in the world are introverts, or or are more introverted than the average. And so, it, so improv really is about taking account, not not saying this is the way you must do it but rather being very sensitive to the needs of the team. So for example, someone's language isn't, first language isn't English, then you account for that. So you make sure that you enunciate your words properly and that you, um, you give them opportunities to show, to do their best work. Uh, and, that, and again, you can draw on other disciplines such as uh, there's a concept called cultural intelligence. Um, and this, 
This is uh, an approach to working across cultures. So this is national, usually national cultures, but also language barriers and even professional cultures. And what it's done is it's, and again, it's like improv, like agile, it's been around, the concept has been around for a while. And we've learned things about how we can work well together by drawing on different cultural perspectives. So for example, if you have a, a team of people, some of whom are from uh, East Asia, some of whom are from North America, some are from Europe, then just the way we're brought up is different. And so what to us as human beings feels natural, actually often is culturally dependent. Mm. So if I were brought up in, the, in East Asia, I would have quite a different attitude towards hierarchy, for example, to a North American. So I would be more respectful of hierarchy, more aware of hierarchy. And also I would be more, I would be less direct in my speech. So I would tend to uh, not criticize someone directly what they say, but I'd kind of just gently suggest that what they're saying um, might not be correct and there might be a better way. And so if we're, so the first thing is to be aware of those differences, you know, that we all, we all have different experiences, we're all brought up in different ways. And then the second thing then is knowing what to do about them. And again, the cultural intelligence community, if I can call it that, has figured out ways of doing that. So one way is to, is to train ourselves to separate our perceptions from our observations from our judgments. Mm. And so when something happens, and this, this is really important when it comes to dealing with conflict within a team, because as soon as you start mixing people together, then particularly people who aren't happy or aren't as comfortable with that change as others, then you need to be very mindful of, um, of the opportunity for conflict or for disillusionment. So if you can spot that early and then begin to have those conversations and begin to provide a way that works for people to have those conversations. So for some people it might be, we have it out, or we discuss it face to face. For other people it might be, they want to go away and think about it and write something down. And so there are, again, within the cultural intelligence community, we can learn techniques to say what's going to work for this person. Because culture is, we can't define ourselves by culture because you and I are both British, but we, we have, we were brought up in different places. We have different genes. We have different, we came from different families. So even within the, the same national culture, we're going to be, we could be very, very different people. So we can't define ourselves by culture, but it's just another layer that, or another lens through which we can look at those interactions. And that then helps us not only to smooth over or, you know, to get through those difficult situations, but also to think, how can we work best together? How can we get the best from each other um, to achieve a common goal? And thinking about how we um, how we shift from a sort of very sequenced linear way of working to a more um, uh, intermingled collaborative way of working, the, the sequenced linear way itself is highly structured. In that we finish our bit and then we give it to you. Sure. Um, we give it to the next people along the line, and so on and so on. So it is naturally divided into stages. Um, and we're only doing our stage with other people like us. As soon as we move to a more collaborative, um, networked way of working, you talked about some of the ways in which we can tune into other people that we might normally not normally work with and get more out of each other. But can you tell me something about the structure? So, so having moved from a highly structured approach, which is linear, to a, what could feel like an unstructured approach, What's your view on how to give that sufficient shape and form that people can flow and work together? Sure. Yeah, so, um, so there, again, coming back to Agile as an example, so that's something which mixes up teams and mixes up that sequencing of, of the way that work is done. And so it has a different structure rather than no structure. Mm. The structure with an Agile team is short sprints, so generally two to three weeks. So that's a block of work where you have a defined goal and as a team, you own that goal and you, everyone works together to achieve that goal. And sure, within the team, you're gonna have different specialisms. So you're gonna have people who are really good at programming, people who are really good at um, understanding uh, or empathizing with human beings and seeing the world from their perspective. Other people who are really good at testing and making sure that nothing gets through without being properly tested. So we're all, everyone naturally is gonna to gravitate towards whatever they're best at. But as a collective, what Agile gives you and other structures like that is a way to, to do your best work as an individual, but then to feed it into the whole. 
So collectively, we own that process. And so that's the kind of the sprint. And at the beginning of a sprint, you have a kickoff. So that's when you say, this is what we're going to achieve, or this is what we're going to aim to achieve. And then the team itself, once it's set the goal, then figures out how it's going to do that. So what do the tasks look like? And really thinking about how that breaks down and whether that's achievable in the, in the time frame. And then at the end of that process, you then have a, a review. So you kind of, you have a retrospective. So that's when your organizational learning kicks in, or your team learning kicks in. So you can say what worked well, what didn't work so well, and what can we learn for next time? And that could be a different way of doing things. It could be removing obstacles that would be perhaps unconsciously put in place. And it could be the way, the way that we interact with each other. So when a team is, is used to working together and has built up that trust, then it's, that team is able then to have those conversations. And the, and the more able that team is to have those open and honest conversations, whichever way works for them, then that's when we can then start to see improvements in the way that a team performs. Got it. So, we, so we've talked a bit about how people, how people can uh, mingle together and um, collaborate differently. Can you talk to us about how you can start to bring in fresh ideas to um, help people see things through a new lens? So where, where we have problems that resist solution, <laughs> um, talk, talk to us about the how you go about bringing in innovation and ideas into an organization. Sure. Um, so that's, um, again, this kind of reminds me of uh, another uh, framework that people may be familiar with. So that's Belbin team roles. Um, so within Belbin team roles, it's, um, it's a kind of a tool that you can use for, in management where you can express your preference for certain roles that are commonly found in a team. Um, so this could be that you know, you're really good at crossing the dotting the i's and crossing the t's and you know checking things you're really good at finishing things you're really good at leading and shaping the way things are done um, another role within Belbin is um, what's called a resource investigator so that's someone who is always on the lookout for things outside of the team or the organization or the industry that they can bring in and make change and so that's the kind of the role that I've always naturally gravitated to and so that's so the, the way that so the way I do that personally is I'm kind of just very curious about things that are very different to the things that I'm doing currently. So that could be, I really, you know, so I studied different things over the years from languages to economics to computer science and genetics. I've worked in those fields, but I've also been very curious as well about, um, about physics and about um, geometry and about theater. And again, I've you know, worked in theater. So there's something about, scanning the horizon so what's coming up what's out there that i'm not aware of so it's kind of deliberately seeking out the unknown or the unknown unknowns and then it's then bringing that back in and saying how can i use this and how can i mix this together with what i've the, the particular problem that i'm working on so it sounds like there's, there's a type of person that is particularly good at um bringing the outside in and helping people within a team to see way beyond their current horizon um, and to kind of spread ideas among an organization and, and I think it was it was you who shared an article with me perhaps two two weeks ago about these people who um, who, who knit organizations together and can you tell me the kind of boundary spanning you can sure. about those yeah so there's a concept called boundary spanning leadership so this is the idea that we can deliberately do that within an organization. So within most, with any kind of human organization, whether it's uh, literally like a company um, or a public sector organization or a team or a family or a community, then people naturally gravitate towards people who are like them, similar to them. So that's, you know, that's why we have friends. Um, and that's why we join sports teams and things like that. Now we want to be with around people who have similar interests to us. And within that, within those groups, then information flows freely. But if you want to bring in ideas from the outside, you need to be able to build bridges to other groups. And the people who do that are called the weak connectors. So within groups, you have 
strong connections and strong connectors. So within groups, you have people who are hubs, you kind of like hold the thing together. So that might be someone who, um, we all know someone at work who you naturally go to, who knows everyone else within the organization and they'll know exactly what's going on. And if you've, if you've heard some rumor about the direction the company's taking, they're the one who will know first. And there are also people who have very well connected outside of the organization. So they'll know what's happening within the wider economy or what impact this political change will have on us because they're kind of, they're not only looking at what's happening outside, but they have connections to the outside and they're able then to bring that information in. And there was um, uh, a piece of work done by, um, in sociology, which looked at how people find jobs and what the researchers expected. So the hypothesis was, is that most people will find jobs by asking the people that they know in the workplace, in their family, in their friendship groups. But actually what happened is, is that most people found jobs by going outside. So, the, so they didn't ask their friends, they asked their acquaintances. So the people that they didn't really know very well, perhaps might only see a handful of times a year, but because they were in a different social group, they had access to information that wasn't present within the, that close group. And so by deliberately becoming aware of that and deliberately practicing that as a skill and thinking, what, what is our, if you like, network topology? How, so how is our company connected internally and externally to different and diverse sources of information? Then we can kind of strengthen that and build on that ability to bring in ideas from the outside. Mm. And then when we think about the types of ways in which um, solution resistant problems can be uh, cracked or, or in which a breakthrough can happen. Um, I, it sounds like you've got some interesting views about where that might happen. And you've talked in the past about the intersection of things like emerging uh, technologies, um, science, the arts, you know, these are very diverse um, uh, areas and disciplines, which I don't think we're, I mean, particularly the arts, we're not used to using that in business and tell us, what does that look like? Sure. Yeah, so um, in the UK, we're perhaps not so familiar with using the arts in business. Um, in the US, I would say uh, people are more familiar. And again, particularly with improvised theatre. So improv, short for improvised theatre, is really the American art form. It's something that emerged um, from the early 20th century and certainly like the mid 20th century, um, both as an art form, so something that you would see performed on stage, and then increasingly from the 1990s, something that can be applied in business because business leaders recognize and people within business recognize that actually the skills that you develop as an improviser are incredibly useful in the emerging economy that we began to see happen in the 90s with globalization. So groups were, companies were moving away from this kind of um, strictly hierarchical way of managing information and working. That is still incredibly useful that way of organizing. As you said earlier, it brings together people who are similar and can get things done. Whereas with the emergence of the internet um, and things like email and particularly social media, then people began, began then to form connections across kind of horizontally as well as vertically. And so there was the exchange of information. And with that came this enormous creative potential. And kind of business leaders recognized that actually improv is a fantastic way of of uh, providing us with a model for how we can really make use of those, those kind of interconnections. So rather than relying on being told what to do or giving permission what to do, we can go out and make things happen ourselves. So a great example of that is Google's 20% time, where they are, you know, they allowed people one day a week, uh, which they could use literally one day a week or save up and use in a, a block of time, just to work on stuff that they wanted to work on. And by and often by forming connections with other people in the organization who they wouldn't otherwise work with. So they were able to improvise these, you know, things like Gmail, for example. Got it. So, so if Google is, I mean, many people will know that example of Google and the 20% time, but they might not know other than it sounds like a good idea to spend some of your time just doing stuff that you're interested in. They might not know some of the, the science behind that. Um, what other ways, can organizations start to engineer in um, 
some of these cross connections in how can they encourage more resource investigators how can they become better networked organizations which are good at solving problems and tapping into the world around them sure so um yeah it's a really good question so, so part of that again goes back to um what we can learn from boundary spanning leadership so how do we um how do we give people the opportunity to work together on common goals and a great way of doing that for example is to facilitate design thinking workshops so that's something where you necessarily need to bring together diverse strands of experience and thinking so for example if you want to improve the way that your recruitment process works so normally that would be something that only hr would look into you know that would be like a hr that would be something that hr would be responsible for but hr might decide or the hr director might decide and actually because this cuts across the entire organization and affects recruitment retention productivity creativity which all have an effect on cost and revenue and ultimately profitability in the long-term health of the organization then we need to hear from everyone because at some point everyone has been recruited into the company and at least everyone who's there presently has decided to stay for whatever reason so they've been retained and they all have a different perspective on productivity and creativity and so you want to hear from people in finance and people from engineering and they may have fantastic ideas and brilliant experiences that you would never otherwise have, have, have heard so there's that so there's like if you facilitate if you're able to facilitate those kind of interactions and that kind of workshop so not only are you um can you improve those key metrics for hr so recruitment retention and so on but also you're giving people an experience so you're giving people the opportunity to shine in a way they perhaps otherwise would never have the opportunity at work so you might have someone who's um an intern in the finance department it turns out they didn't even realize this, they're absolutely brilliant at, um, at designing user interfaces in software. But because they've never been, have that opportunity, they would never know that. And, the, and, and their leader, you know, their, their manager or the HR director would never have known that unless they had the opportunity. So by, by having these kind of um, cross, you know, activities that span boundaries with, with a common goal, you not only give people the opportunity to improve the company itself so improve the the way the company operates but you're also giving the opportunity to people to discover things about themselves and discover things about each other and that shared experience just like a holiday with your family that shared experience creates those memories create those bonds mm. and they persist they persist well beyond the lifetime of that of that workshop or that project that's interesting so creating um opportunities for people to have an experience together where the the, the memories and the the half-life the, the positive half-life of that is is pretty long sure. and and the other thing i picked up there was the idea of inviting people to contribute to uh, achieving a goal without making any assumptions about what their contribution might necessarily be so what we typically do is we say well we need to do this project to achieve this goal so let's get someone from finance and someone from hr and someone from engineering and someone from whatever to to do that and we've specified exactly what format and what content each person will provide and i think you're suggesting could there be ways to offer up a goal and invite people to um suggest themselves how they might contribute to it and that that could could pose some surprises um, both for the um, people responsible for that project in terms of how people might contribute, but also the people themselves, like, oh, I didn't, you know, I, well, I do photography in my spare time or, um, or actually I used to do a lot of facilitation in my old role and I haven't really done any of that here, but I think I could on this project. That's interesting. I get to show a bit, show and develop a bit more of myself. Sure, absolutely. And, um, and, that, and I, I've, I've worked as a user experience designer. Mm. You know after kind of working as a software engineer for a long time and for me that was one of the real joys of discovering that is that as a i can work as a facilitator so in a sense you know i kind of viewed that job in ux as i was primarily facilitating because what i was doing was giving people creating space and time for people to contribute in ways they wouldn't otherwise contribute to in work and it and you need to provide some structure for that so you, just like an improv you can't just say, 
say to people who've never done it before, right, get on stage and be funny. There's, in improv, there's a hidden structure. So there's like a scaffold which you can't see on the stage, but it's there and it's something that you practice um, in advance. So you can't rehearse what you're gonna say because there is no script in improv, but you can practice that, that technique. And it's the same in facilitating user experience design workshops. So we can, we can give people that scaffolding so we can help them to, for example, step into the shoes of their, their users or their customers using particular techniques, mm. so being observations, usability testing of what's already there. And again, we can give them, we can facilitate techniques for them to express their ideas about how a solution might work. So for example, mapping out a user journey or sketching user interface mm. or even role playing a service. So it doesn't have to be something physical or digital. And by allowing people to experience those different techniques of expressing themselves and, and working, then that's when we can then uncover those kind of hidden diamonds that are already present in the organization. So not only does that solve a particular problem for the company, but just think about how much more engaging that is for someone in the organization. This is really interesting and it's something that's that's been emerging in the last few webinars we've done around uh, reducing friction in organizations, which is the idea that um, if you are a, a finance manager, You've probably trained as a bookkeeper or an accountant. You'll have full, a full set of technical training and there is um, a system and a process for you to follow and you follow it. And sure, there is some complexity and some uncertainty, but the way in which the content of that work is delivered is, is already specified. Now what we have in organisations are um, invisible... <laughs> uh, techniques invisible skills which and, and some of them have been made visible like leadership so leader, you know leadership still still not an easy way to say oh well if you do this this and this you'll be a great leader <laughs> but nevertheless we you know there are endless courses and books about being a good leader and some shared understanding and shared language about what that is in practice but in many other areas of business the scaffold as you describe it is invisible and therefore it's not something we we get the opportunity to practice or master or design together um, and like that falls across things like working collaboration it falls across meetings it can fall across things like um, the pr preparation of budgets so how do you decide what you're going to what you're going to submit as your budget for next year itself a kind of challenging practice and and it sounds like some of the work that you do is about teaching people scaffolds that are currently invisible and helping them practice and master them. Sure, yeah, I'm a scaffolding chief to be like. Yeah, head yeah. scaffolder. Yeah, I guess a scaffolder, yeah. Mm. And, um, and I think that, um, you know, that is one of the joys, really, of the facilitation, is when you create that scaffold, and then people use it in, in, in ways that you would never have expected. So, for example, you know, literally when Michelangelo painted the Sistine Chapel, um, he, I think he built his own scaffolding, literally, because it was like huge. And he was lying on his back for like yeah. 60 years painting this thing, paint dripping on his face. And so, um, but look at what he produced. Who could have known that um, by getting the scaffolding right, he could produce something as, as incredible as that. Mm. And it's the same, um, I've had the same joy, you know, facilitating design workshops where you create a scaffolding. And I, I, I worked with, um, with a client and they had mixed teams, so people from all across the business working on um, producing an app to, uh, to engage people more in, in the business. So it was about sharing information and about discovering things about each other. And people who had never ever worked on building an app before really surprised me what they produced. They had these fantastic ideas and fantastic insights into what works well and what doesn't work well currently in the business and what might be done. And it was a real honor really to, to kind of be present in that and to see mm -hmm. just what people are capable of if they're given the right conditions and the right scaffolding. So <clears throat> thinking about the real, the real world, which both you and I live in, <laughs> um, and I can 
hear organizations that you and I might work with saying, well, that's great and all that sounds wonderful, but we are hugely under pressure. We have enormous constraints. Our people are already busy and tired and stressed. Um, we're under-resourced. The market's just shifting all around us under great pressure. The idea that we can just send our people on a one-day thing or, a, or to work on a project that's, that's outside of their core area is just a luxury we don't have. Well, how would you respond to that? Sure. Um, let's say, yeah, absolutely, completely understand that. Um, and it, it's a common theme over the last certainly 10 years of more work, fewer resources. How do you, how do you make the time? And I think one way is to just take small steps, just to say, well, can we set aside um, half an hour a week, an hour a week, an hour a month, whatever it might be, just to try things out. So if we're, particularly if we're stuck in a problem, rather than doing it in the way that we've always done it, think, well, can we use this as an opportunity for at least an hour or two to experiment with a different way? And will that, will that be enough just to kind of shift things, shift our thinking, shift our approach to help us to get through to the next stage? So that's one option. Um, another option is to think about, um, again, going back to, uh, to HR. So certainly within the tech industry currently, it's very hard for people to recruit talented software engineers and, and other technical stuff partly because of Brexit, um, but also it's just, you know, because unemployment is very, very low. Sorry, employment. Yeah, unemployment is very low at the moment. So lots of people have jobs, so there's not much spare capacity. So again, it's, um, if you think about it strategically, you can think about, sure, we could run a workshop to solve a particular problem. But you could also say, as well as that, we have these additional benefits where we discover talent within the organization. So we may already have people in the organization who, are, who could be brilliant programmers or brilliant user experience designers or brilliant finance directors, whatever it might be. So therefore it's much easier and more effective for us to think, well, do we have some already or groups of people already in the company who are able to step up and do the jobs that we're currently recruiting for rather than looking outside? So in a sense, I'm kind of saying, um, don't do the thing that I would normally do, which is to be the resource investigator, as in looking outside of the boundaries of the organization, but look inside first. And part of that looking inside is giving people the opportunity to shine and show things that, show you things that you wouldn't otherwise know. That's interesting. I, th I think it's very easy to, um to lionize what's outside of the organization, the way other people are doing things, all the good stuff's outside, and to totally overlook what's going on inside the business. I also think a really easy way to kind of disenfranchise people is to, to march in and say, we're going to do this new thing and it's going to be brilliant and this is how we're going to do it and you're all going to love it. And to totally ignore all the people who are already trying their hardest to spark small fires. One thing I would always try and do when people like you and I work in organisations is to find and get behind people who are already behaving the way the organisation is trying to encourage rather than risk totally alienating them in the, in the process. And I love it that you start, you start with the gens on the inside. Sure. And that, and that approach of starting with the people who are already doing the things that you want them to do, that you want the organization to do. That's, you know, that's classic solution focused approach. Yeah. That solution focus. Yes. And, and an oh, element of a pretty good inquiry, I guess. Find and play up people who already have those all those, all those strengths or where it's already working. Sure. And that and that's a very improvisational mindset as well. Mm. Take what's there and build on it. So we yes and. So in, in improv we call that yes and. We right. Accept, we accept what you're offering. So everything we say everything's an offer. So whatever you're doing or saying, that's an offer, and I can build on that. We can take right. that. And Anthony, if um, organisations wanted to work with you on any, any of these things around building cultural intelligence, around developing boundary spanning leadership, around very practical workshops to allow people to solve problems in different types of groups than they might normally do that, what, what can they do with you? Sure. So um, I think there's, there's probably three things that uh, organisations can start doing this. So one is to have a particular problem that they want solved. So it could be something that um, is just one of those niggly problems that's just hanging around. And we haven't, you know, as an organization, we haven't figured out how we're gonna solve this. It needs solving, but we haven't figured out how to do it yet. So that's one approach. So that would be um, an organization might come to me and say, look, you know, how do we, for example, um, I used to be head of marketing technology for a charity. How do we um, 
get beyond our current constraints of fundraising from the public. We kind of hit a plateau. What if we do can't seem to get beyond that? What, what more can we do? What else can we do? So for that, you might say, well, um, we can work together on that and we can look at what's been done already. We can look for the things that are working. So again, it's partly it's challenging those assumptions. So it's saying, well, is, is nothing working? What is working? Let's find that. And also what talent do we have in the organization? So it might be, for example, so I worked uh, for an organization that had a brilliant data scientist in the organization, but in a completely separate team. They weren't, worth, they weren't involved in marketing at all. And yet they are able to bring in skills such as figuring out the lifetime value of donors so that then you can then target resources to those, to those donors who are the most likely then to become, to donate larger, larger amounts. So we can look at what we've already got and then we can then look at um, trying, trying new things and that could be bringing in ideas from the outside. So for example, can we experiment with, um, with gaming technology? Can we experiment with virtual reality to deepen our audience's empathy with the, you know, with the uh, people that we're serving as a charity? So it doesn't mean that any of those things are guaranteed to work, but it's more about let's look at what our options are. And we often have more options than we think we do. Mm. So that's, that's the, the first option. So that's the first way of working. So focus on a particular problem. The second one is then to, um, is to do that, but to do that deliberately involving a diverse range of people within the organization. So that's kind of like taking that a step further. So that's when we might say, right, we want to work together to achieve a, a creative breakthrough. So we're not only going to solve the problem, but we're going to create this capacity within, within the organization and connections and trust and relationships within the organization. So we can do this again without needing to bring someone else in externally. And then the final thing then is, is uh, training. So that's kind of more focused then on, on that capacity building. So it's kind of, um, it's away from a particular problem, but looking at more generally, how can generally we get better? Can we get better at working across boundaries, which could be linguistic boundaries, it could be cultural boundaries, professional boundaries. And then how can we get better at bringing in ideas from the outside and having that kind of deliberate approach? Great. <clears throat> and Anthony, where would people find you online? Sure. So uh, the best place to find me is via my website, which is intermingled.org. Wonderful. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, and we um, are hugely looking forward to putting into practice some of your thoughts on cultural intelligence on boundary spanning leadership on really practical ways to start to engineer um, design thinking and collaboration across organizations join us next week for the next uh, friction-free uh, webinar in our series and um, thank you for joining thank you Karen.